Good afternoon. I'm Bob Hauser, Executive Officer of the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to this first afternoon session of the April 2021 meeting of the Society. The American Philosophical Society acknowledges with respect that it resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with this land continue to this day. We honor the Lenape community and those of other Native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research awards, and engagement activities. While my introductions of our distinguished speakers will be brief, more complete biographies are available on the meeting page of the APS website. In fact, there is now a link to the meeting page on the front of the website, www.amphilsoch.org. There you will find the biographies, the list of attendees, the list of new members' books, and the virtual book display. Please note that you may access closed captioning by clicking the CC link at the bottom of your screen. Also, there will be a question and answer period after each talk, and you may enter a question at any time using the Q&A link at the bottom of the screen. Our first presentation will be by Paul Moravec, who will discuss his recent oratorio based on William Still's engagement as a leading Philadelphia conductor in the Underground Railroad. Paul Moravec is a celebrated composer and professor of music, a graduate of Harvard College and Columbia University. Mr. Moravec has taught at Columbia, Dartmouth, and Hunter College prior to his current position of university professor at Adelphi University. He was also the 2013 Paul Fromm composer in residence at the American Academy in Rome and recently served as artist in residence at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. In addition to his various awards and fellowships, Mr. Moravec was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Music in 2004 and the Arts and Letters Award in Music from the Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2012. He was elected to the American Philosophical Society in 2010. 20, 2010, yes. And now uh, to Paul. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm going to be talking today uh, from my workshop. I welcome to my workshop. This is where I wrote the work in question. In fact, many of my pieces from the last 10 years. Um, I, I'm coming to you from Glen Cove, New York, uh, on the North Shore of Long Island. And I'll be talking about how to make an oratorio uh, on an, an historical subject. In this case, it's about William Still and the Underground Railroad. It's called Sanctuary Road. But first, a little background. Um, some years ago, my librettist in this work, Mark Campbell and I wrote an opera called The Shining. Uh, it's an opera based on the Stephen King novel. You probably know the Kubrick film version, which premiered at Minnesota Opera in 2016. It was a happy collaboration. Uh, we found that the operatic form was the ideal way to convey the passion in Mr. King's terrifying story of love and madness. And we decided to write uh, another work together. And now for something completely different. I suggested making an oratorio about the Underground Railroad. Um, we were already convinced of opera's primacy in musical storytelling, but in this work, Sanctuary Road, we also discovered what we consider an equal power in the form of oratorio, that is uh, dramatic power, musical dramatic power. Um, a brief word about oratorio and uh, opera, and uh, there's a reason for this, which I'll get to shortly, why I'm comparing these two genres. They originated at essentially the same time and place in the early 17th century Italy. Uh, both employ uh, solo singers, chorus, orchestra, and they tell stories through libretti set to music, but there are some important differences. Uh, as opera developed uh, and, and originated in Florence, developed there originally, it was mainly and has remained mainly a secular genre, whereas Rome-linked oratorio has been generally associated with sacred subjects, 
though not always, as we'll see. Um, another distinction between the two is oratorio's greater, greater emphasis on the role of the chorus. And to me, there's something about the sound of a large chorus that gives me the impression that the whole world is singing. There's this great generosity of spirit, a kind of universal and timeless uh, feeling. Um, and certainly that's appropriate given oratorio's origins in religious ritual. Uh, the most obvious difference, of course, is that opera is stage music theater with sets, wigs, costumes, etc., whereas oratorio is unstaged and traditionally performed uh, in a church or in a concert hall. Um, and while opera has developed into a, a very, uh, over time, especially beginning with Mozart and Verdi and Wagner and Puccini, became uh, more naturalistic and realistic and more specific in terms of character and so on, um, the, um, the, uh, what happened in oratorio is it basically remained a kind of cool and formal and ritualistic um, kind of uh, a genre. However, um, even though Johann Sebastian Bach never wrote an opera, I still consider him one of the great musical dramatists of all time. And you can hear it in the St. Matthew Passion, uh, that or oratorio, for example. So uh, uh, music drama can be conveyed simply through the words and the music. Um, and then of course, everything that goes into opera and so on, those are all, um, you know, not just add-ons, I mean, they are enhancements and so on. Um, but there is a strong family resemblance between oratorio and opera. This is relevant to the work we're talking about today because this work started out as an oratorio it premiered in uh, 2018 with the Oratorio Society of New York in Carnegie Hall as an oratorio, but Mark and I are now turning it into an opera. So this, this work will now have two iterations. The opera version will have extended scenes and uh, more material, and it will be more kind of opera friendly. And it will premiere, God willing, the, the pandemic, God's willing, it will premiere at the North Carolina Opera in Raleigh, uh, next March. I'm going to share my screen now uh, to give a little more context and to explain what, what this is all about. I've written about, um, let me know, by the way, if, uh, if this works, okay? I don't want to continue on if it's not working. Okay, so here we go. Am I sharing the screen? Uh, yes, you are. Good, thank you. Um, so of the 200 compositions I've written, here are a number of, of works that are specifically about American history. Um, this is one of the strands running through my catalog here. Um, uh, okay, so the first of these is Songs of Love and War, where I took actual uh, letters written to and from the fronts of American wars, uh, Vietnam, World War II, World War I, Civil War, made a cantata out of it for mixed chorus and baritone solo and orchestra. The second work here is called Useful Knowledge, which might ring a bell here. Um, this was uh, commissioned and premiered uh, at the APS April meeting in 2006. Uh, and it concerns the writings of well, of Benjamin Franklin. And here's the cover of the Naxos recording here, available <laughs> online at Naxos. Um, and it's called Useful Knowledge. It involves uh, um, Randall Scarlatta, native Philadelphian, plays, uh, portrays um, uh, Benjamin Franklin himself and, and, uh, and recites his words, or sings his words, it involves also a glass harmonica, which of course is uh, Benjamin Franklin's invention. And this is the text here. This text uh, concerns his spiritual life, which might sound a little counterintuitive when we're talking about the, emb the embodiment of the enlightenment, but I thought this would be an interesting uh, take on uh, this very complex figure. These are all uh, Franklin's own words. And the final uh, part here is really the crux of the matter. To pour forth benefits for the common good is divine. We are spirits. 
that bodies should be lent us while they can afford us pleasure, assist us in acquiring knowledge, or doing good to our fellow creatures is a kind and benevolent act of God. So this is my, um, my tribute to um, Benjamin Franklin. Um, the next of these works is a, a, a big oratorio, very Old Testament-like, about the uh, Children's Business of 1888, um, premiered at Opera Omaha. Another work about Benjamin Franklin, this is an opera I wrote with Terry Teachout, uh, about Benjamin Franklin and his son. As you might know, they were enemies during the revolution. There's a story. And now we come to Sanctuary Road here, which I'll get to in a minute. And these are more oratorios coming up. A Nation of Others is about a day in the, in the life of Ellis Island. It will be at Carnegie Hall. It was postponed. It will be at Carnegie Hall next May. Um, and then we're working on a new oratorio uh, about, of all things, the history of US voting rights. We don't have a title yet. And now we come to the Sanctuary Road as an opera uh, coming up next year. And then finally, our, our, our the final oratorio that we're working on so far uh, is about Ruth Coker Burke's uh, amazing, very special person. She's in her early 60s. She lives in Arkansas. She was an early advocate for uh, AIDS patients in the early you know, panic days of uh, the, the, uh, of the uh, epidemic in the early 80s. And here are my other operas. I wrote an opera with another opera with Terry Teachout called The Letter, premiered at Santa Fe Opera. We made a comedy, a backstage comedy about the, the making of The Rite of Spring premiere in 2011, and then our opera, The Shining, here. Um, so that's sort of a, um, a background to where um, Sanctuary Road comes from, at least from my point of view. Okay, we come to William Still here. You know those blue markers that you see all over Philadelphia? Well, his is at 244 South 12th Street, and it says, while living here, he was an underground railroad agent who helped slaves escape and kept records so relatives could find them later. A wealthy coal merchant still also found, uh, helped found the first black uh, YMCA. Here's an interesting uh, document here that authorized him to publish the records that he gathered uh, during his time in the Underground Railroad. And it was uh, published in 1872 uh, under that title, of course. Um, and this is sort of a, a useful, uh, you know, page here because it shows a picture of William Still. Um, this is his brother, Peter Still. Uh, this is uh, the most moving and remarkable of the, of the stories that we tell in the opera version coming up. Uh, and it's described here more succinctly. During the uh, summer of 1850, William Still interviewed an ex-slave named Peter who after purchasing his own freedom had traveled to Philadelphia in search of his family. While listening to the man's story, still realized that Peter was his brother, separated from, from the family 40 years earlier when their mother had fled from Maryland. Um, so what William was able to do, in addition to uh, embracing the, the brother that he always heard about his whole life, he was much younger than, than Peter, um, but he was, he was able then to guide Peter to his mother who was still alive and also to, to meet eight of their siblings. It was a very big family. And um, this is one of the reasons that I, I, it seems that William still um, kept the records uh, and, and didn't destroy them. The other members of the um, vigilance committee, like Robert Purvis, they all destroyed the records that they kept because uh, for obvious reasons it was too dangerous. Um, and William still, in spite of the danger, kept them. He hid them in a, in a cemetery during the Civil War, brought them out again, and then um, published them in an effort to, in part, to reunite uh, family members who had been separated in the years of slavery and in, in the Civil War. This is an interesting picture here, a contemporary picture. It can, it, it, it's a little small here, I'll enlarge it. Um, this is one of the stories here. It's a remarkable escape. This is a character named, or an actual historical figure named Henry Box Brown, who mailed himself in a crate from Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia. And uh, the Vigilance Committee is opening the box. There's William Still with the chisel, and Henry ba Box Brown is emerging there out of the crate here. This is a picture of the Vigilance Committee. 
and you can see William still down here at the bottom. <coughs> and he was uh, appointed at the age of 30, he was appointed uh, the chair. So he, you know, from an early age, he was uh, a real leader. And uh, some historian, in his own time, he was known by some people as the father of the Underground Railroad. He was enormously uh, courageous, both morally and physically, um, and, uh, and effective. He was amazingly effective. Um, okay, where am I? Apologies. How do I do this? I didn't mean to do this. Okay, let's go to the re let's go to the recording. Back to the recording here. Okay, here is um, the cover of the recording. There's the libretto. We'll get to in a minute. And here is some pictures of people involved. That's me. This is Mark Campbell. And here's our cast of fabulous. Uh, soloist, um, soprano Laquita Mitchell, uh, mezzo Rehan Bryce Davis, tenor Joshua Blue, who just moved to Philadelphia. He's very happily a, a new Philadelphian. Um, Malcolm Merriweather, and last but not least, Dashawn Burton, who portrays um, William Still. And Dashawn portrays only William Still, uh, the other uh, singers portray various characters. Uh, they go in and out of, uh, of various, uh, uh, inhabiting various characters. There's the Oratorio Society of New York in uh, Carnegie Hall, and there's the wonderful conductor, uh, Kent Tridel. Okay, since I have limited time here, um, I thought I would start at the beginning and basically walk through um, the, the story here uh, uh, of what we did here. Uh, Mark uh, had the uh, inspired idea to center this around William Still and all of the fugitive slaves and the story and their stories uh, that he aided uh, in their quest uh, for freedom. Um, and then the, it created a, a trajectory, a, a story arc that starts out in slavery and ends ultimately with freedom. After the Civil War, uh, William still receives these letters from the fugitive slaves that he helped from Canada. And that's how the, uh, the um, oratorio and the opera uh, uh, end uh, with this, this kind of um, apotheosis of, of hope and, and triumph at the end. Okay, so we, we begin with the actual words, this is the subtitle, it's a very long subtitle of the book. Th these are William Still's own books, uh, his own words. Um, the Underground Railroad, a Record of Facts, Authentic Narrative, etc. And then he starts to describe how uh, all these fugitive slaves uh, arrived in uh, his office in Philadelphia uh, by steamer, by, by train, by foot. And then he talks about, uh, the, and then the chorus comes in and they sing about how uh, their testimony will never be forgotten. What I'm gonna do now is, is play the opening. Underground Railroad. A record of facts. Authentic narrative, letters, etc. Narrating the hardships, airbred escapes, and death struggles of the slaves in their efforts of freedom, as related by themselves and others, 
or witnessed by the author, together with sketches of some of the largest stockholders and most liberal aiders and advisors of the road. By William Still. Write it down, write it, write, record, recount, chronicle, write, write it down, every word. move on now to the second movement. Um, and this is um, 
these are slaves living in slavery, imagining freedom. And the text is called Quietly. Um, listen for a motive, what I call the freedom uh, light motive uh, in this um, ensemble number. It sounds like this. Okay, the third movement then, um, the chorus, customarily in an oratorio, the chorus has, uh, uh, fulfills a few roles. Uh, they do commentary, um, they comment on the action, and very often they are in the action. They are participates in the, participants in the action. And in this case, they are slave hunters. This is a, a chorus of slave hunters. And these are actual posters and documents um, um, this, uh, saying reward will be paid, runaway slave, age appearance, countenance, describing all these runaway fugitive slaves. Um, and, and the soloists are saying, okay, here we are, we're on our way to New York, Boston, or Free State. Above all, they're heading to Philadelphia. Um, and that's where William Still comes in, of course, because he's uh, head of the vigilance committee there. Um, the fourth movement is the first of our stories here. This is an actual historical figure named Ellen Craft, who with her husband escaped by getting on a train and she was dressed up as disguised as an old white man. She powdered her face with white powder and her husband pretended to be her valet. He was in a different car. They got away with it. They came to Philadelphia uh, and they got married. Um, so that, that was, this is a, a case where the Underground Railroad, the escape ha happens actually by railroad on, uh, on, a, on a rail car. Um, in the fifth movement, we have the first of our interviews. Now these are crucial because these are, this is the foundation of the book. This is, this is all the material of the book that 
William Still published later. The, he interviewed everybody and like a secretary, he wrote everything down. Um, so this is the first interview. This is the first of our, the sixth uh, movement is the first of our um, uh, encounters with William, uh, sorry, with Wesley Harris. He's going to be in three movements on the run and we follow his progress throughout uh, the course of the uh, drama uh, periodically. In the seventh movement, here's the story of the remarkable escape of Henry Box Brown. Um, and there's a little bit of humor here, <laughs> which is that uh, it, this horrifying circumstance that he's in and the suffering. Um, the, the, um, he complains because the baggage handlers can't read that this side up with care. Um, and, um, but it's, it's about his um, hope for freedom. And, um, and it's the uh, second or uh, third iteration actually of the freedom motive. <laughs> appears in this movement, it appeared in the previous movement before, it's going to appear in five subsequent movements. And this, the, the, the idea of leitmotif, which is, of course, we associate with Wagner, he does it his own way, I do it my way. But the power of leitmotif is that as you transform the motive, it, and you keep weaving it into the musical texture, uh, the listener may not even be aware of what they're hearing but you're working in a subliminally uh, on the memory of the listener um, and, and, and unconsciously they're following the changes in the leitmotif, the various iterations of the leitmotif, uh, very much in the way that they'll follow the transformations of a character in a novel or, or in any story. So it's a very, very powerful uh, uh, tool here. All of the uh, characters have their own leitmotifs and I use them extensively in you know, most of my dramatic works in The Shining, you know, it's on steroids. Um, and I use it here too, but the, the principal one and the one that, you, that unifies all of the characters, all of the figures in this uh, story are the uh, uh, that, um, freedom motive that, that I uh, played. Um, now, part of the legend, part of the story that uh, Henry Box Brown told about himself. He, came, he became quite famous, actually, uh, and uh, went on lecture tours and so on after the uh, Civil War, describing his remarkable escape. And the story that he tells is that when he emerged out of the box, he recited uh, Psalm 40, and then he passed out from exhaustion. Um, and uh, so what I did was I, I, I have the chorus commenting on the action here, very much in the way that Bach would do, for example, in the, in the St. Matthew Passion with a chorale. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my calling. We then resume with what, what Wesley Harris's uh, run north. Uh, we have another interview uh, between William Still and um, a female character. And here we have the story of Harriet Eglin and Charlotte uh, Giles who escaped on train um, pretending to uh, visit a, 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 an aunt in the North who was dying, but they made this up. It was an imaginary aunt, it was all a ruse. Um, and they were given permission to get on the train and they just kept going uh, to Philadelphia uh, and, and stayed there and then moved on from there. And this is the final um, episode of Wesley Harris's run here. Um, and then we come to the final interview where William Still has several of the fugitive slaves in his office. And he's saying, we're giving you some new clothing, a good meal, money, a ticket away from here to New York and then Boston. One aspect of the uh, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was that, um, uh, fugitive slaves were no longer safe in the North per se. Uh, uh, the, the true sanctuary would be Canada. And so he's sending many of these fugitive slaves onto New York, Boston, Buffalo, et cetera, to get across the border to Canada where they would be uh, safe. And now I come to 
um, the story of Clarissa Davis, where she's praying for rain in, in, uh, in this town where she is um, to conceal her movements as she's heading north. And um, let's, and, the, and in this, um, this is, this aria and this ensemble number has a kind of um, cathartic apotheosis of the freedom motive. I'll play it at the piano here. At the end of it, you hear, Okay, so that's rain, and then the fifth, we're almost near the end here. The fifteenth number is called interlude, um, and these are the years of the Civil War, 
And um, the chorus sings wordlessly on ooh and ah with uh, the spooky orchestral accompaniment. And I imagine this as the a chorus of the dead soldiers uh, in the Civil War. We needed to show the passage of time here uh, in, in some way, and this is the way that I chose to do it. And then the finale, we return to William Still, um, picking up after World War, uh, sorry, of the Civil War, five years since I heard hit these records, five years, five terrible uh, years, the record survived. And he talks about the his favorite letters that he received from uh, Canada. And these are all the voices of the fugitive slaves thanking him for uh, his service to them. And this is the grand finale, which involves all of the soloists. Uh, it ends with a big anthem to freedom. And we have the biggest iteration, the, mo the grandest, most majestic iteration of the freedom motive uh, to round out and, and uh, bring to an end uh, this drama. So let me stop share and I return. I'm at the 42 minute mark here. Is that, is that right? Should that, I'm? <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> not a problem. I'm supposed uh, to end at, 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 this, at this part point, is that right? Uh, yes, let's go into Q and A. Um, Bob, okay. the floor is yours. Wonderful. That was that was terrific, uh, and I I have to say, as someone with with um, what should I say, not the best hearing in the world, I really like being able to read the uh, libretto uh, as I listen. It really adds uh, adds to my pleasure. Let me start with uh, one question here for myself, which is, um, what what brought you to choose? Uh, oratorio and opera as your forms of, of, of composition? Well, I was a boy chorister in the Episcopal uh, tradition, um, one of the great educational traditions in the world, particularly when it comes to music, because you're a professional musician at the age of seven or eight, you know, you're <laughs> learning to sight read. And you may, I remember I made a dollar sixteen a week, you know. And it's been sort of downhill since then, but uh, yeah, that was, that's sort of where I peaked financially. Um, and that's a joke. That's a composer's joke, okay? A, um, in any event, um, I was a singer. And so I, I, I'm attracted to uh, singing. Okay, the next question, Spike. Yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, and... Um, and I don't know, there's, there's nothing better than um, a scene in opera that really, really works, especially an ensemble scene. For example, when you think of uh, the great ensemble uh, quartet in Rigoletto, oh, yeah. uh, or when you think of even better, the quintet scene in West Side Story, which I think is an absolute masterpiece. Um, you can see that music theater, music drama does things that no other art form can do. And, and those those are examples of, you know, the thrill that a composer gets when 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 they get it right. Um, so I mean, there's certain things you can do in music drama that you can't do in any other medium. I've written most of the pieces I've written. I've written about 150, uh, you know, instrumental pieces and the string quartets, etc. And you know, I'm I'm pleased with all of them. I'm, I'm proud of all of them. But um, they can't do what you can do in words and music, in music drama. It's, it, it takes a composer's um, life to a completely different level. Also, the, it's the greatest challenge of all, so. Wonderful, I, I, I appreciate what you said about uh, how well my musical careers pay because I have a son who's a musician. But anyway, here's sorry. The, <laughs> <laughs> the next question uh, um, uh, is from uh, Christoph Wolf. And he asked, hey. 
<laughs> yes, and he asks, what dramatic changes are you making for the opera version of your oratorio? I assume that you're not merely putting singers and choir on stage and have them sing in front of a set, but also create some effective stage action. Yes, and the stage action, mostly I'm leaving up to the wonderful director we have. His name is um, uh, uh, Dennis Darling. And he and we're I'm working with him. This is a work in progress, and he's telling me what he wants to happen. I tell him how I think I can make it happen musically, and so on. So these, the, you know, there's a lot of horse trading here. The, the, you know, we go back and forth about, and, and of course, Mark Campbell, the librettist, is involved as well. One big change we've already made is that we've included. This is not in the oratorio, but we've included in the opera version the meeting between uh, uh, Peter Still and William Still. And it's, I know how this sounds, but I, I think it really works. I think it's extremely emotional, very effective. I think it's, it will be something. So we're really taking the oratorio to a new level, uh, not just in terms of action and interaction between characters on stage and sets and so on, but musically as well. We're, it's, it's, it will be a, 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 a kind of expanded, extended iteration, incarnation of this um, original work. Um, Jay Stiefel asks uh, as, as follows, William Still's records are among the treasures of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. How did you uh, first become acquainted with them? This was uh, Mark's idea when, when he, uh, Mark Campbell, I was aware of them, but I didn't really, I hadn't read them. It's about 800 pages long, and it's not a narrative in the sense of, you know, beginning, middle, end. I mean, it's really more like a kind of uh, encyclopedia. It's all available online. I mean, you, you just go to Gutenberg or one of these sites, it's all, you know, uh, public domain. And that's what Mark did, and that's what I did, and, and this is, that was the source that we, uh, that we used. Could you tell us a little bit about the casting process? That is to say, how you what what you look for in voices uh, to match these uh, real people that you're portraying in the in the oratorio. What I'm looking for is that they sing what I write. <laughs> okay. Condition number one. <laughs> this is number one. And, and of um, course, all the, you know the the singers that you hear on this recording, which by the way I heard I well I I. I uh, please buy the recording. Please listen to the recording because um, by Zoom you can't. You really can't get a sense of it, um, and it it really is. Um, it, you really need to hear it and also follow along with the libretto. In any event, we are very fortunate with these five soloists because they're all fantastic and they're also they're also all great actors. Uh, in addition, also. Uh, I remember the first time we all got together and we sang an ensemble, all five of them, and they blended and spectacularly, their blend, their intonation, everything was just spot on. So it was, it was just this one of these happy accidents where everybody comes together at the right time in the right place. Well, that's terrific. And let me mention again that the recording, if I have it straight, is available on Naxos. Right. Uh, yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this has been a, a wonderful uh, treat for us to begin the, uh, the afternoon session.